my good people what is going on it's anil from wood woodwork i haven't been here in a little while but i'm bringing some more jewels and gems for you guys we're working on a kitchen island river table i know it's a mouthful but this client they commissioned us to do their bar top which was a part one of this series here i'll have it linked down below or on the screen and essentially we're just coming back in to finish off the project with the island first things first you always want to make sure you get all the softwood anything that will cause the epoxy to pull away from your material you want to clean the wood up as best as possible so we use our rockler chisels to chisel out any imperfections and then we came back in with these wire brushes just to clean things up to get it down to the bare wood. And we're just going through all of the grooves, the cracks, the crevices, and just really getting in there, cleaning it all out, using different type of wire brushes. There's some that are firm, some that are a little bit softer, some that are spiral. You can see I'm using different edges or different wire brushes. And we're just going through the whole piece of cedar just to clean it up. Now, if you guys know anything about cedar wood, you'll know that this wood is extremely soft. So the client wanted to have the cedar exposed, but I told him, hey, you're gonna have a lot of nicks and cracks and damages. So he elected to gloss over the top, similar to his, uh, his countertops, so that the cedar was protected and the epoxy is what he would put his cups, he would touch, people would see and all of that there. Now, we're using our surf prep sander. This is a five inch orbital sander. This thing is so powerful. You can see how much dust it pulls out to just smooth out those sides. And right here where I'm measuring, you can see off to the side how smooth that surf prep sander bought the material to. And all we're doing is finding the center point of the cedar slab so that we can cut it directly down the middle. Because you know with river tables, you have to cut your piece down the middle to create that river in the center. So we're using our foam board as a backer, and we're just using our TS-55 track saw to cut that down the middle. This slab is about two inches thick, so that's the starting point, and we're gonna get it down to one and a half inches. We're very close to that final measurement, but we should be okay. And here what I'm doing is I'm finding the best format for the river, just testing different things out, flipping the wood over, just seeing what makes the most sense. Then once we had the format set, it was time to make the mold. We're using a particle board for this project here. Particle board, it's, it's cheap. You know, if you ruin it, you could throw it out and remake another mold. But the, the mold was a few inches bigger than the actual table itself on all four sides. That way there was a little bit of play. And when it came down to cut it to its final size, you know, I can really get in there and cut it down and not have to worry about it being too tight or too small. Once we cut it to its measurements, then I came back in with some Tyvek tape. I always use this. I see guys using uh, mold release and other things of that nature, but Tyvek tape always worked for me. So I'm gonna continue to stick with it. This is a little tip. When you're screwing your sidewalls into place, the sides, the front and the back, always put a bead of caulking in between where the particle board base is gonna meet the sidewalls. The reason why is because it creates a barrier so the epoxy will not seep out of. And when I tell you there was not a single drip of epoxy in this mold, literally nothing poured out whatsoever. What's up guys, quick update, it's day two now. If you like this format of video where I kind of jump between the voiceovers and I jump back on camera, leave it down in the comments below so I know if you don't want to see my big head anymore, just let me know and I'll stick to voiceovers. But uh, we got the mold made, we caulked everything, we let it dry overnight. Um, I went through just to check to see if there were any uh, exposed areas or spots that cracked and I just re-caulked them. So I'm gonna give it about like 30 minutes, 40 minutes to dry before we put the cedar pieces inside of the mold and then we're actually gonna move it to the office right because the office has an AC unit I can control the temperature it gets hot in here so if tomorrow it's gonna be very hot I don't want the epoxy to be sitting here in 90 95 degree weather plus we can cut stuff out here so we're gonna move this over to the office put the cedar pieces inside of it and then get started with the epoxy 
So now it's almost time to start pouring epoxy. What I'm doing here is I'm just checking the table to make sure it's leveled. That way the epoxy doesn't set on one side and creates a higher side. Once I have it leveled, you can see down below, I shimmed up the board so that it was as level as possible. Came back in with my DeWalt portable vac and just vacuumed out any dust, any debris. And then I started putting in the cedar slab. So here's the left side and then I'm putting in the right side. And then once we have that in place, you know, we wanna make sure we clamp them down so that they don't move around because the epoxy wants to settle in all areas of this mold. So you wanna make sure the cedar slabs are pressed down. Now, Total Bow did sponsor this video with epoxy. You know, we're using the best of the best. It's a two to one part process. So two parts resin, one part hardener. We split the buckets so that we can get as much as possible within our five gallon bucket with even ratios. If you guys aren't aware, Total Boat has this bucket that has a handle down below. It's a five gallon bucket with a handle. It is the most effective bucket you could possibly use when pouring deep pours or pouring a lot of epoxy simply because the buckets get heavy and if you don't have anywhere to hold it's kind of hard to maneuver so check that out i'll have it linked down below for you guys to take a look now we just mix it on up mix it mix it mix it on up yeah and then for the pigment we're using bronze the reason why we're using bronze is because the client has copper finishes in their kitchen. Now, bronze was the closest to the finishes that they had in their kitchen, so we elected to use this. He saw it as well and he liked that color, so we decided to go with that. And I'm doing two pours with this one here, so I'm gonna do my first pour at about one and a quarter inch, and then I'm gonna come back in and do the final pour. I didn't wanna do all of it at one time where, you know, I risked, risked, risked <laughs> it cracking. Wow, that's, that was a doozy. So after it dried, I gave it about three days, it dried, and then I came back in and I sanded everything down just to create that mechanical bond. Because with epoxy, there's two types of bonding. You have chemical and mechanical. Chemical is where the epoxy isn't fully dried or fully cured, and you pour directly on top of that and it just completely bonds. The mechanical bond is where you sand, you create grooves and cracks within the epoxy, which allows for the second coat to kind of grab onto this first coat. And you wanna make sure that your colors match as close as possible. When it comes to dyes, you wanna make sure you're paying attention to how many drips you put in that epoxy or, or measure out how much pigment you're putting into your epoxy because you will see a variation in the color when you have off to the side. So the bottom may be a little bit brighter than the top. Then we came back in with some tack cloth, cleaned it up. So denatured alcohol to you know really remove any debris and dust and then we pour the final coat you'll see we're getting in all the grooves there's so many holes within this table so you really want to make sure you're pouring enough epoxy where you're getting into all the grooves all the crannies and cracks it's time to demold and as you can see not a single bit of epoxy poured out anywhere it remained within the mold and that's from that that caulking being applied to the sidewalls then once it's demolded we bring our slab over to ed to have it flattened and to remove all the high spots they use this massive cnc style machine that really can support any size table that we bring to them so they have a, a massive four inch cutter head that removes the the top and the bottom and then they have a sanding disc as you can see here in this clip that sands to 80 grit then once we finish up over there, I bring it back to the shop and I use 120 grit on a belt sander to remove some more material. I'm not going to bore you guys so much with this sanding process, but you know how it goes. 120, 150, 180, 220. You can keep going higher than that if you're going to finish it with the bare wood, but because we're going to use gloss, you don't have to go that high. So we stopped at 220 using our belt sander and then following back through with the Merca to really get those fine finishes. Now, once we were finished sanding, it was time to clean up the edges. And this is the reason why we make our molds bigger so that you can knock off those outside edges that are exposed. You can see there's caulking there. It's just not a clean edge. So you wanna make sure you have enough room to cut off those outside edges without destroying or making your table smaller than it needs to be. I thought the table was a little boring 
with just this flat 90 degree edge. So we use a Rockler chamfer bit that was 30 degrees. So it wasn't as steep as a 45, but it had a nice detail that it added to the edge of the table. This is on the bottom side, so don't worry, it's not the top, it's on the bottom, but it looks super clean, super cool, and the client loved it. So off camera, you didn't catch me pouring this epoxy, but we did pour tabletop epoxy just to get this coat down below. Now what I'm doing is routing out the grooves for the C channels. These are steel C channels that I picked up from my local lumber yard. Um, and this is just gonna keep the slab flat for a long period of time. It'll keep it from bowing and cupping. What you saw me put below this piece of wood here was a two-sided tape. You'll see later on in the video, that stuff is extremely durable. So if you're ever working a project where you need a surface that is a temporary hold or something along the lines of that, definitely use some type of double-sided tape. That way you're not drilling into your material and now you're having to fix holes. Then once we have our material taped down, we're using the Bosch router to route out that groove. Once we have that groove routed out, we come back in with these rockler chisels to tighten up the edges. The edges are curved over, so this just squares out the edges for that C-channel and makes things look a bit cleaner. One thing I will say I like most about these chisels is the fact that it's a kit with five different size chisels. Not only that, but it also comes with a case, so you, all your chisels are in one place, and then it has a chiseling stone. So when your, your chisels get dull, you can pull that stone out and sharpen your chisels. You can pick these up at Rockler, either online or at your local Rockler store. And in this clip here, you'll see exactly how strong this tape is. I'm trying to pull it out, and I really have to use force to get that lifted up. Now I'm sure using brass bushings would probably make this process easier, but because I'm not that skilled yet with my woodworking equipment, I elected to do it this way. We're just routing out those outside edges so that the C-channel sits into the groove or sits into the slot. As you can see in this clip, how it sits in that slot. Then once the C-channel was in place, I came back in with a centering bit to center out the holes that I was gonna use my drill bit to drill out the holes for the threaded inserts. Put a little bit of tape on that drill bit so that we didn't plunge too deep. Now I didn't use epoxy in between the threaded insert and the wood, but because this wood is extremely dry and we sealed off everything with epoxy, I don't see this bowing or flexing on us. Then once I had that in place, basically just test fitted everything to make sure it worked smooth. I found that it worked perfect. And then I just went back through and added those threaded inserts to all the holes. And now we're routing out a groove for the aluminum track for the LED light strips. Instead of adding the light strips directly to the bottom of the table, we're gonna sit it within an aluminum track that has a diffuser over top of it so it softens the light. Be sure you soften your edges with an eighth inch round over. If not, you will have sharp edges that can cut you or your kids. Now here's a tool I really appreciated, these grabble tools. They make moving odd shaped and large materials quick and easy throughout your shop. They work well on solid surfaces, but porous material it doesn't work that well on, but handling our river table was a breeze using these tools. Then once we had it back in the office, we wiped it down with a tack cloth before we started pouring this tabletop epoxy. The first coat was a 16th inch just to fill any voids and just to get into the cracks and crannies of the surface. And then we started pouring deeper flood coats. Here we're just using the trowel to move the epoxy around and then I came back in with a paintbrush just to break that edge so that it flattens out. You want to make sure you do use a torch to blow out these bubbles because using a paintbrush will cause bubbles. Then after the epoxy dried, we came back in and sanded the surface so that we can pour the second coat. And if you remember what this process is called, is it a chemical or mechanical bond? Comment down below. After everything was sanded and cleaned off, then we came in and we poured our second coat. This would be a flood coat. This is gonna be an eighth inch thick and I'm just using a notch trowel to move that epoxy around. Don't let it pour off the edge first, get it around the whole surface and then come back in and allow it to flow over the edges. Now it's time to start the install process. So what I'm doing is I'm measuring out where things are laying out and I'm just trying to center this island as best as possible and then once I have it centered where it needs to be, I'm putting tape underneath on the actual table itself so that I have the exact placement of where it needs to sit when I take it off and put it back into place. And here you can see I'm adding the C-channel into place before we start adding the LED light strips and the aluminum tracks. 
These aluminum tracks were purchased off of Amazon. I'll have it linked down below, but they're easy to install, they're lightweight, and they're also easy to cut. So you can see in this corner, I used a 45 degree miter that I used an angle grinder to cut out. Then I added a slot where the adapter for the LED light strip is gonna be placed. I used CA glue to hold it in place, but we wanted to make sure it was exposed in the event that we had to change it out at any given point in time, we had access to it. And here you can see I'm lining everything up, making sure it all fits into place. Then we pull it back out. We use this Starbond CA glue. This is a lightweight CA glue. I probably should have used a thick set CA glue, but this worked fine for this project. If I find that it comes out of place, I'm gonna reinstall it with a thick set and I'm gonna use the accelerator to get it in place quickly. And then we just worked our way around the perimeter, adding that LED strip into the aluminum track. Then once we have the LED strip in place, we double back in with the diffuser. And what that diffuser does is just softens the light, makes it look nice. You don't have the harsh lighting from the LED strip. What I like most about these LED strips is they're flexible, so you can bend them how you need. They're also easy to cut. I use a pair of scissors to cut the miters around the corners, but you can use a miter saw or an angle grinder and putting them in place is quick and easy. They also have a low profile design so they don't stick out too far past your surface depending on how deep you route that aluminum track. But once you have it around the edges, you're good to go. And then we came back in. As you can see, I'm using that grab old tool once again to move the tabletop around. It makes moving things so easy and simple. And what I'm doing underneath, I'm just looking for those tape markers so I can place this island back into place. Once the table is in place, we checked it with our level to make sure everything was leveled on both directions. And here you go. Wow. Look at that bronze finish. Wow. The land of make-believe. Now, if this is your first time here, be sure you like and comment down below because you know the algorithm loves that. But for those that have been here up until this point, thank you guys for showing your support. We have more content like this on the way. I'm glad you guys made it to the end of the video. And for that, have a great one. Peace.